Bonjour tout le monde and good afternoon. Welcome to the session, uh, the virtual cafe series session entitled Public Service Climate Literacy. I'm so glad that uh, so many of you have been able to join us today. My name is Lawrence Hansen. I'm the Associate Deputy Minister at Environment and Climate Change Canada, and I have the privilege of being uh, your moderator today. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining you from the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I encourage you to take a moment to reflect on your traditional Indigenous territory from where you're joining us. J'aimerais reconnaître que puisque je suis à Gatineau, Ottawa, je suis à la territoire traditionnelle non cédée de peuple Algonquin Anishinaabe, les événements virtuels nous permettant de nous rassembler à partir de différents endroits au pays. Je vous encourage donc à prendre un moment pour penser au territoire traditionnel sur lequel vous vous trouvez. Throughout the event today, you may be you may submit questions by clicking on the icon that looks like a raised hand. There is some time built into today's discussions for questions and answers at the end. I'm particularly looking forward to today's discussion in terms of what it means to be a public servant ready to meet the challenges presented by a changing climate. L'année 2023 a été qualifiée d'année ex extrême, alors que des collectivités partout au Canada ont connu des, des feux de forêt, des inondations, des sécheresses, des records de chaleur, des épisodes de fumée et bien plus encore. Les répercussions ne sont pas seulement visibles dans les lieux où nous, nous vivions, mais aussi dans notre travail, alors qu'elles influencent à la fois les gestes que nous accomplissons à manière dont nous le faisons. For some of us, our role in climate change is clear. We may work directly on programs or policies critical to addressing climate change. But for, for others, you may, be, you may be being called upon to consider climate change in your work for the first time. To make connections to climate change may seem more indirect for your work. Regardless of where you're finding yourself in relation to climate change, we know that a changing climate and our response to it will continue to transform our world for decades to come. Alors que nous commençons à s'appliquer plus largement une, op une optique climatique dans les politiques et les programmes de gouvernement du Canada, nous devrons également tenir compte de l'importance de l'éducation et l'environnement. Les connaissances en matière de climat et d'environnement sont des éléments clés à l'atténuation du changement climatique et à l'adaptation à ses effets, mais elles sont souvenir négligées. Ces connaissances sont essentielles pour surmonter les, les, les enjeux de changement climatique. Climate change literacy helps us understand and address the impacts of, of, of climate change. It also empowers Canadians with the knowledge, skills, values, and attitudes needed to act as agents of meaningful change. To increase environmental literacy across Canada, and among youth in particular, Environment and Climate Change Canada has established an environmental literacy and citizenship program. For the public service, being a public service means remaining responsive to our changing world, ready to rise to the challenges, equipped with the necessary knowledge and skills. Being a climate smart public servant means understanding how climate change affects your work, how your work affects climate change, and being empowered to contribute to solutions. C'est dans les conversations que nous aurons aujourd'hui ce que les connaissances sur le climat signifient pour la fonction publique et les types de soutien qui sont à disposition aujourd'hui. I am thrilled today to be joined by three experts on climate change science, solutions, communications, and adaptation, who are also leading educators well-versed in the knowledge and skills needed to participate in climate solutions. I'll begin by way introducing our, our, our three panelists. Dr. Sarah Birch is the Executive Director of the Waterloo Climate Institute, Professor and Canada Research Chair. Dr. Birch is also a lead author of the Intergovernmental on a panel on climate change, sixth assessment report, and helped to lead expert input into Canada's first national adaptation strategy. Dr. Robin Cox, professor and director of Resilience by Design Lab at Royal Roads University, is the head of graduate programs in climate action leadership. Dr. Cox's most recent projects include the development of Canada's first climate action competency framework. And Dr. James Meadowcroft, 
professor in the School of Public Policy, an administrator at Carleton U University, and a past Tier 1 Canada Research Chair in Governance for Sustainable Development. Dr. Meadowcroft is also the Research Director of the Transition Accelerator, a pan-Canadian organization that works with others to identify and advance visible pathways to a net zero of Canada in 2050. Our three panelists are also the lead authors who supported Environment and Climate Change Canada in the development of a suite of new climate change literacy courses now available to all public servants, which we'll touch on later in the discussion. We're so pleased to have such experts from today with us to talk about such pressing issues for the work of, the, of Canada's public service. Thank you and, and welcome again to Sarah, James and Robin. So now what I'd actually like to begin the, the formal part of the session by having our, our panelists uh, talk about the importance and challenges of workforce climate literacy. I'm going to start with Sarah and then I'll turn to James and then Robin. Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Deputy Hansen. I really appreciate the warm welcome and uh, the invitation to, to be here today and to work with the excellent team at Environment and Climate Change Canada to to develop this course. Um, I'm calling in today from the traditional territory of the Attawandran, Anishinaabe, and Haudenosaunee people, um, currently known as Waterloo. Um, very happy to be a part of this conversation. Um, it was certainly a a really um, exciting challenge and an honor to participate in the development of this of this course and to have such a broad reach um, across the country in the in the federal uh, public service. Um, and I think you know I think we can all agree that this summer certainly made visible in a new and very powerful way to many Canadians at least it has been visible to to many others around the world for some time, but. Um, that that climate change is un unfolding before our eyes um, as we speak, and it threatens to um, to undermine our, our ability to to thrive um, and to uh, foster and, and create resilient and sustainable communities. Um, so uh, I think it's also important in that context to reflect on. The fact that that as we saw and as we'll continue to see, you know, climate change doesn't affect us all equally. The impacts of climate change, the costs, the consequences, um, are unevenly distributed across this country, across communities, with vulnerable groups um, being hit the hardest. Um, so we have these decisions to make in our jobs, you know, it, when, whatever our job may be, uh, we find ourselves in a place where. We are making crucial decisions about what the next several decades will look like, and each one of those decisions can lock us into a pathway that is deeply unsustainable or one that is sustainable. So, you know, any of our decisions about the way our homes are built or the way homes ought to be built, um, the infrastructure we invest in, the way cities look and function, these are all crucial ingredients in kind of the pathway that we're going to follow um, as Canadians. So here we have this opportunity to kind of take a moment and build some some fundamentals, build the foundations of our knowledge about climate change so that we can be clearer on what we know for sure, you know, what is very well established science and where we're still learning and where we're still being surprised. And that was one of the challenges that I really um found enticing and interesting to grapple with in the context of this of this course. But ultimately, out the other side, um, the most important reflections in my mind are that um, that there isn't a single silver bullet. There are so many tools and capacities and strategies that are needed to respond um, in an equitable, just, creative way to to climate change. So this is everybody's everybody's challenge. It's a shared responsibility. Um, and these three courses are just the first step in my mind in establishing those foundations so that we can collectively take responsibility as we move forward. That's all I'll say for now. I'll say more later. Excellent. Thank you very much. That gets us off to a really good start. Um, James, I'll turn to you next. James, you're muted. James, I think you may be muted. Thank you for that. I don't know how long I've been on Zoom and I still can't always get the mute button. 
Um, yes, well, thank you for the opportunity to uh, talk to you today. Um, I I think um, in, in doing these co this course, one of the things that really um, uh, I thought was particularly important is that um, civil servants, but also Canadians more generally, understand that there are things that we can actually do to deal with this problem of climate change, both from the point of view of um, uh, dealing with our emissions and slowing the advance of uh, global warming, but also in adapting our society to uh, the kind of changes that are already in the pipeline. Um, because often people uh, are quite kind of, the, the problem seems so huge that it it's very hard to know, well, where do we begin and what difference can uh, I as a civil servant or I as a Canadian or a homeowner or whatever do uh, in face of this, this uh, big global problem. So one of the things in the part of the course that deals with uh, mitigation, with trying to deal with the causes of climate change that uh, we tried to emphasize was that there really are, we know really practical things that can be done both as a society and as civil servants and even as individuals that we can contribute to getting a grip on this problem. Um, a second thing I would say that um, we tried to emphasize is really the importance of trying to, and this is particularly for the public service, trying to think strategically about this question. We've been talking about climate change for more than 30 years, and we all know kind of little things that we can be, be, do, and we've talked about trimming our emissions there or reducing 5% of our emissions by such and such a date and things like that. But really the the science now tells us quite clearly that to stop the driving forces of climate change, we have to get to what is popularly termed net zero. In other words, we've just got to stop adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Or if we do add some, we've got to figure ways to draw what the residual that we emit back down again so that we're not continually increasing the, uh, the degree of heating that uh, we're getting from uh, the atmosphere. So this um, kind of objective that was uh, adopted at the Paris Climate uh, Summit, uh, the objective of globally getting to net zero, really does kind of change the way we think about climate change, because it means that we don't kind of just have to get rid of a few emissions here or there. We really have to change the way some of the major systems of, in our society work. We have to change uh, how we build our buildings and particularly heat them. We have to adjust our electricity system to get rid of carbon sources, um, for instance, natural gas for power. We've got to get rid of that, remove to renewables and expand the system so that it can also uh, uh, allow us to electrify other elements of society, for instance, uh, transportation with electric vehicles and so on. So these big changes, um, um, I guess what you would say is we can't think about everybody does a little bit and then we'll all do a little bit. <laughs> what we realize is there are going to be profound changes over the coming decade, particularly in our energy system. But the, I mean, the bad news is they require a lot of work and there are a lot of them. The good news is we actually know how to do this now. And Canada's already taking steps, not just to decarbonize economy, our economy, but also to build a vibrant, prosperous, equitable society uh, over the coming decades. Uh, and that's critically important because Canada just, Canadians don't just want a zero carbon economy, they want a prosperous society. And so things like developing the new industries that will be growing in, in this context of decarbonization become critically important. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, James. I'm going to turn to Robin in a second, but just as a reminder to folks, um, if you do have questions, use, using the the hand function to put them in because uh, that makes it uh, easier, hopefully, to be able to get to some uh, questions toward the end. So please, please feel free to start putting in your questions now. Um, and with that, I'll turn to Robin. Thanks so much, uh, Deputy Hansen. Very happy to be here and very happy to be here with my esteemed colleagues and all of you uh, who have joined here today. Uh, taking this time out of your work schedules, I know, is a big deal. Um, I know it would be for me as well. And so I uh, really want to uh, thank you for joining us. 
uh, like my colleagues have already said, uh, entering into these courses is a place to start, and it's an important place to start. Climate change, yes, is upon us, and we have an opportunity, as well as the, dealing with the threat of climate change, we have an opportunity, I think, to really envision a world that we want to live in and address climate change with that in mind, with the issues around equity and justice, with the issues around how we become more connected in our culture to the world around us, to nature and to each other. I'm joining you here today from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, specifically the Lekwungen and Kosamson speaking families and their ancestors. And as I'm sure with many of you, I sit here in wonder at the world in which I get to live in. I, I'm, I feel very privileged to live in what I know as Victoria. And I feel very concerned about climate change and how that is going to impact me, my family, my community, and our society as a whole. So I think we really have to look at this as an opportunity for all of us to engage in what I think of as collective leadership. Working in the public sector, you're already in leadership positions regardless of your job. You already have the capacity to join in and leading the changes that uh, James mentioned, some of them very profound changes, and supporting your family, your communities, our society, our shared world in making those shifts in positive ways for Canada and for the rest of the world. I think uh, one of my favorite phrases is, every job is a climate job. Regardless of whether you're focused on it directly or indirectly, we are all going to be impacted by climate change, every sector, every community. And and so when we begin to think like that, we have the opportunity to feel empowered through knowledge, through conversations, through our collective actions to really make a difference. And I think if you've joined the public sector, you've joined because you want to make a difference. But that's at least part of your motivation is my guess. And so I think that this is an opportunity for all of us to really take climate change as seriously as we need to and as we haven't necessarily in the past and to launch into the changes and the actions that we need to take in order to address it effectively, to address it as quickly as possible and to move forward in a way uh, that brings us into a world that we want to live in, that we want our children and our grandchildren and generations to live in. And so with that, I think uh, I, the most important thing, I think, with these courses, with all three of them, is to take them, to stay open to learning, to stay open to thinking through with yourself and your colleagues what it means to you and how you effectively engage as a climate action leader in the work that you do and in the positions you're in. So I'll leave it there and I look forward to the conversation. Excellent. <clears throat> thanks. Thanks so much, Robin. Maybe I'll actually go right back to you with kind of uh, an, an initial question that, that mm -hmm. ties into to, into the Resilience by Design Lab. So just wondering if you could talk a little bit uh, and, and, and understand you developed this, this sort of climate action competency framework and I'd like to get a sense of, of what that is and what you kind of see as, as core competencies that, that mm -hmm. somebody really needs to engage with climate, especially within the context of, of, the, of the federal public service. Great, thanks. <laughs> thanks for that question. <laughs> um, we have developed a climate action competency framework. It involves competencies related to mitigation and adaptation, climate action. And it's a broad framework because the competencies that we need to address this are broad. Climate action is distributed across society, as I said earlier, across every sector. And so some of the specific competencies in each sector, whether it's engineering or planning or policy development or any of the many uh, jobs and sectors that we have, will need specific technical and technological competencies. But they're also going to need competencies that generalize across uh, many jobs and many sectors. And a lot of those core competencies are things you already have and that you need to, um, from my estimation, that you need to build, enhance, you know, amplify. And those are things like critical thinking, those are things like uh, understanding leadership and how to lead change and how to do that collectively. 
I think one of the key dimensions of the competencies that we require, um, one of the key competencies is creativity. We need people who can innovate and really think creatively about how we're going to tackle this. Yes, there are things we know we need to do, as James pointed out regarding mitigation. There are things we know we need to do with adaptation, but how we do those and how we do those in ways that reflect this need for justice and equity will, will require creativity. So creativity creativity, critical thinking, the ability to collaborate. And probably every job has some component that says, you know, you need to be good at teamwork and you need to work collectively. That is amplified for climate action. We need to work collectively and we need to be able to bust silos. So we need to work across the silos that we have created. So the competencies, competencies that are associated with those building those kinds of relationships, sustaining teams and, and collectives and networks, uh, being able to manage conflict when it arises, differences of opinion when it, when they arise, and then still move forward. And that also means moving forward with uncertainty. I think, uh, just to close it off, I mean, we're not necessarily ever going to know exactly what we need to do when we think we need to do it. But we need to move forward, even if we don't have all the information, as long as we're drawing on the best evidence available at the time in which we are operating, and move forward and take actions that are associated with our jobs and with these collective initiatives. So I think those are some of the critical competencies. The framework lays out others, and um, I'll make sure uh, through the people organizing this that you have access to uh, that framework after this, after this uh, webinar. Thanks. Thanks very much, Rob. And I'm glad you brought up uncertainty, and I think that is something I'm going to uh, double back to later on in, in, in the conversation. Um, um, so that's also serves as a warning to the other panelists because I, I am going to improvise a bit just to increase the degree of difficulty today. Um, so uh, James, uh, um, you know, uh, you're doing a lot of work on net zero, and this is something that uh, on a personal level, I spend a lot of my work day thinking about, um, you know, there's certain terminologies you hear a lot of about about uh, dead end pathways to 2050. Um, when we talk about resilience building, you know, what, what, what do we mean by terms like maladaptation. So kind of would like to get a sense from you about, you know, in a climate literacy concept context, what it what are we what are we talking about when we're talking about strategic action and, and what are the risks if, if if we aren't really thinking in factoring in climate change and our decision making on a on a day to day basis? So I guess I'd start that by uh, uh, by saying that one needs to begin by understanding where the emissions actually come from today in our society. What what activities, processes, industrial processes, and so on. Where does it all? Where do, where does the problem reside? And that's kind of the first thing. And and right away we see that about eighty percent of the emissions, something like that, come from um, fossil fuel combustion uh, and from our energy system. And then there are also some uh, emissions associated with waste or associated with agricultural uh, practices and, th and things like that. But we need to start, if we want to think strategically about the problem, we have to start by saying, where exactly are the problem sectors? And then think about, well, how could those be transformed in the future? And one thing I would place very high highly is to think about this in sectoral and regional terms. Because of course we want a low carbon Canada or a net zero Canada, uh, Canada in 20, 2050. But um, the whole economy is a really complicated thing and the country is very different from one side of the coast to the other. So it helps to break the problem down more into bite-sized pieces if we think about what needs to be done in, in Quebec to move things forward? How, what, how is that different than Alberta or British Columbia or whatever, but also sectors? So agri-food is just a really different sector than the electricity system or the built environment. And in each of these separate areas, we need to see some transformational change, but the conditions are quite different. Uh, the enablers, the barriers are different. And so we need policy uh, adapted and decisions adapted to where things are in each specific sector uh, and region. So that's a, a, a second thing I would say. And then a third thing I would say is, uh, because we've mentioned, Robin mentioned the, the unknown or risk or un uncertainty. So there's a lot we don't know about what the world is going to look like in, in 2050, how Canada will work, how big will the economy be. There, there are many questions that 
things that we don't know. But already our knowledge is enough to tell us some things about this net zero world. What, what would a production systems, what would a country look like that wasn't generating greenhouse gases? For example, we know that electricity uh, is going to have to take a lot more of the energy needs that end use combustion of fossil fuels, that's to say burning natural gas as a furnace in your home or driving a car with an internal combustion engine running on gasoline. You can't have that in a net, in a net zero world. So those sorts of changes already tell us a lot. We need a, be a decarbonized electricity system, a bigger one. We need people driving electric vehicles. We need heat pumps uh, and electricity and other low carbon uh, options to heat our homes and so on. Other sectors are much more difficult. For instance, agriculture is quite difficult. Uh, Four-fifths of agricultural emissions are associated with um, fertilizer use, um, animal agriculture, particularly beef production for manure and things like that. And they're not easy solutions, uh, as, as easy as say, oh, just drive a battery electric car. And same for some heavy industry section, sectors like steel uh, or cement making. And these will take longer. So one of the things I would say strategic action means is focus your dollars and your investments on the things we know how to do and scale them up as fast as possible. And there's some other things that are not so clear how to solve, like airplanes. <laughs> we don't have the technological step to make a big leap there, but that's okay. We have several decades to do this, and we will need to increase research and experiments and things like that in order to learn how, how to do these things in the future. So just to wrap back to what you mentioned about dead-end pathways, there are things we can do that reduce emissions but don't actually, aren't actually on a pathway to net zero. So for instance, we know cars, light duty vehicles are moving towards electrification, but um, you know, we do still have programs that spend a lot of money putting ethanol, blending ethanol into gasoline. We know that's not gonna scale up to all of Canada driving on gasoline biofuel cars. So, you know, strategically, it's more important to support electrification than a technological option that, you know, can't deliver at scale, uh, really at, at net zero. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much, James. Um, and again, I think that these are some, you're touching on some issues that I would love, love to come back and talk to all panelists about. Um, Sarah, I'll, I'll turn to you now um, and, and, and research you're doing on, on you know, the unique contributions that are, are possible from, from all parts of society. So I think, you know, there'll for sure be some public servants on this call who are kind of really engaging um, on climate change issues for the first time and really don't even know where to start. Um, uh, so just just curious to get a sense of, 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 of your sense of What's a good place to start? If you're just beginning, what are some things to think about? What are some things to bear in mind? You might not become a climate expert, but some some core competencies that you think are particularly important. Sure, yeah, it's a great question. I, I mean, I think my initial reaction to just the observation that there are a lot of folks out there who are coming to this for the first time, I mean, I think that's really, that's exciting. <laughs> that's, that's a move in the right direction and uh, you are not alone in that, that you are in good company um, as you're sort of jumping off this this diving board and and uh, starting to, to acquire these skills. Um, and you know, to bring this back to a, a point that that Robin made, that you know, what is really needed here is um, creativity and a really diverse set of skills and capacities. So, you know, um, ideas, solutions, new applications of solutions we already have can come from all sorts of places and there is expertise held in all of your hands, those of you who are here on this call. Um, uh, and and taking these courses, you have skills and 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 abilities to bring to the equation that are so uh, so urgently needed. So I think that sh that there's that shared um, shared responsibility there uh, that I think is really important. And to draw it back to you know, and James made this point that that a lot of the technologies, at least to to at least make make the first 
crucial, important steps to say our 2030 or 2040 climate change goals. Most of those already exist. The real challenge here is amplification, scaling up, speeding up, spreading, sharing, and adapting and adjusting these solutions so that they're appropriate for the place in, in which the actual physical space, the community, the environment in which they're operating. And um, and so that capacity to, to adapt, the capacity to adapt these solutions to our, our local context, to our own community and priorities, to see the connections among things, so and to and to work better and more collaboratively across sectors, across disciplines, um, I think is such an important ingredient in um, speeding up and making faster progress. And, you know, um, in the over the last few years, as you mentioned, um, Deputy, I was working with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is this uh, global, you know, um, body of scientists that try to synthesize the, the state of climate science and social science so that we can make better decisions on the basis of that science. And one of the key findings from that work was um, that, yes, our emissions over the last 10 years globally are the highest they've ever been. Not good news, seeing as we've been talking about this for a long time. But we also now have examples of countries and communities all around the world that are on track towards reducing their emissions at the pace and scale necessary to, you know, to bring us into this kind of net zero world. And that means we have pathways to follow. We have, um, you know, templates to follow. So this isn't open territory. You know, it's not a completely um, a world full of questions. We have a lot of really good answers now. Um, so I would say thinking in systems, you know, thinking across our boundaries and breaking down silos between disciplines is a crucial capacity. Building trust and, and you know, our engagement with communities um, so that we can, collectively generate these visions of what a low carbon resilient Canada could and should look like, which by the way, won't look only one way, it'll look lots of different ways in communities and provinces, as James mentioned, across the country. Um, those are just some of the capacities that I think the three of us weave through these courses um, and would be the next steps following taking these courses as really important capacities to build. Excellent, Thank, thanks very much, uh, Sarah. I think I'd like to talk about, and we've been, we've mentioned them in passing. I want to come back to them now very specifically, which is these uh, three courses that, 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 uh, that each of you have uh, d designed uh, one course. And so this is, this session I think is a bit of a kind of, it, the cafe language is kind of fitting because this is sort of the, the amuse-bouche uh, for, for the three courses that, that are now available. Um, I will say as somebody, um, who f uh, this is my second time in this department. And I first joined the department in 2004 and I went home on Friday and I was doing employment policy and I arrived at my new job on Monday and I was doing climate policy and uh, I, I would have paid uh, good money uh, to have access to these courses at that time and, and here the school is offering them for free no less. So uh, I just, in first and foremost, I really encourage people on this uh, on this call to, to, to sign up and, and take these courses. And I, I think the, our conversation now is a little bit of an opportunity to kind of get a sense of what those courses are. And so what I'm going to do is turn to you each in turn and give a sense about the course you worked on and maybe your sense of how it kind of fits in with the other courses as well. And so I'll kind of um, I'll just kind of go in reverse order that what I just did, and I'll turn right back to you, Sarah, if you would like to talk a bit about your course and how it links into the others. Mm, thank you. Yeah, so the course that um, that I developed fe does feed directly into the the two that follows, and essentially sets the stage, lays lays the foundations in in climate literacy. So what that means is helping um, learners first understand what climate is, uh, how is climate different from weather, you know, what we feel on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, where is the carbon in our system, in the, in the oceans, in the forests, um, buried underground in coal, oil, and gas, et cetera. So understanding all how all of the parts of that climate system interact, um, just as kind of a fundamental uh, level of understanding. Um, and then we move on to a question of what is changing. So how do we know that change is happening in the climate? And how do we know that humans are responsible for that change, which is a really important ingredient uh, in our understanding of this, because then that suggests some where the solutions might lie as well. Um, 
So what is changing? Uh, how does that affect, how does that change affect different ecosystems, um, uh, our ability to produce food, the health of our forests, um, the health of people? Uh, so what are those climate change impacts um, that are, uh, that we see today and that we project will, um, will increase into the future? Uh, so that's kind of the state of play in terms of climate change impacts. And then we move on to understanding where, as James mentioned, where are those greenhouse gas emissions coming from? We have to be very focused and strategic in understanding where the most important sources of those emissions are and what the trajectory in those emissions have been over time. Are they going up? Are they going down? Um, do we have the technologies already available or is there still a lot of room for innovation in these sectors? Um, and then finally, we wrap up the course um, by talking about uh, the governance dimensions and the policy dimensions of how we actually make decisions around climate change. Woven throughout all of this, um, because of um, uh, excellent colleagues, Dr. Kelsey Leonard uh, here at the University of Waterloo, uh, who is a citizen of Shinnecock First Nation, um, and Dr. Graham Reed, uh, highly esteemed colleagues who supported this process, um, weaving an Indigenous uh, lens throughout the entire course so that we understand more about both how those impacts are being unevenly distributed, as I mentioned, across communities um, across Canada, and also the capacities and the resilience and the ingenuity within Indigenous communities to respond to, to, to climate change. So that's kind of the broad strokes of the course from the science fundamentals on through to the impacts, the sources of greenhouse gas emissions, and what we can do about it. Thanks very much, Sarah. I'll, I'll turn to you next, James. Yeah, uh, great. Thanks, Sarah. So um, the course that I worked on is really focused on um, mitigation. That's to say, what can we do to, to stop uh, climate change? Uh, and um, uh, it's framed around the, the objective of getting to Canada to net zero by, by 2050. Um, so it starts just by discussing a little bit what do we mean by net zero and why this changes the context kind of from the slightly in incremental approach that we've had over the past couple of decades. And it really sets up uh, a new challenge for the next uh, 25, 30 years and, and beyond to, to um, uh, move Canada towards net zero. Um, next, we look at the sources of emissions, uh, where do they come from in Canada, uh, both regionally, uh, how do the regions differ, uh, what are the important sectors, and so on. Um, then we offer a little bit of a portrait of how the energy system works today. Where do we get, the, what are the raw, raw materials from which uh, we generate energy, fossil fuels, um, uranium, uh, power from water and so on. And we look at the electricity system, but also other uses uh, of energy. So for instance, uh, for transport and so on. And then we say, specify what would need to change? What would the broad outlines of a net zero energy system look like in 30 or 40 years? And so we give a broad idea, portrait of such a system, specifying what we know pretty much for certain now and other things that we're only going to sort out over the next couple of decades. And a good example there is we know we're going to need more electricity if we're replacing fossil fuel and use fossil fuels. But do we know how much will be come from nuclear, how much will come from wind or solar? Not exactly. And it will differ in different parts of the country and it will evolve over time. But that doesn't mean that we can't do anything now because we don't know what the final snapshot will look like in 2050. On the contrary, we have clear pathways to, to uh, advance the file. Um, we also talk a little bit about the role of government and particularly policy instruments. What mechanisms can we do for governments, all kinds of governments, including indigenous governments, municipal governments, provinces, uh, the federal government, of course. What policy instruments can we deploy to help industry, citizens, the whole economy transition towards, uh, um, towards net zero? And then we talk to some extent about what, what a net zero economy would look like and what the opportunities for Canadians are, um, the promotion of a, a better society, a more fair and equal society, including dealing with issues uh, such as Indigenous issues, but also gender and other kinds of equity and so on. 
um, and the kind of industrial policy and investments that governments need to be making over the next couple of decades to build a strong and resilient net zero economy in the future. So really the big message of this course is we actually know how to do this and it's doable. And here are the steps that we should be taking now in order actually to build this kind of society in the future. Thanks Great. very much, James. Robin. Thank you. So I, uh, I and a team of amazing people worked on building the climate adaptation course. And in some ways, the order of this, the, the foundation course, mitigation, and then adaptation is a common order. And I think in part, uh, adaptation because we in some ways are only just beginning to think about how we address the impacts of climate change in a good way um, as and Sarah pointed this out in her opening remarks as we see the impacts of climate change already increasing in the magnitude and frequency of events and you really can't be living anywhere in Canada uh, without being conscious of those impacts or at least experiencing them whether you connect them to climate change or not so the adaptation course begins with an introduction to what do we actually mean by adaptation? What do we mean by climate change impacts? And, and again, referring back to some comments that James made uh, earlier in his opening remarks, this idea that we need to come to terms with that these impacts are very local and regional and they will differ across different localities and regions and and often those impacts are crossing localities and regions i know here in british columbia you know we've had an atmospheric river we've had a heat dome we've had heat waves we've had many you know wildfire seasons that have been very destructive and those cross localities and regions and so we have to think about that but we also have to think about how we support specific localities and communities uh, and organizations and governments uh, adapting to those impacts. So part of what that requires and what the course also touches on is this idea of effective climate risk management. So being able to assess the risk, to understand the risks, and then look at what those risks mean in terms of specific communities and populations with a particular lens around, and it's easy to say words like equity and justice, but we know that uh, my background's in disaster management, and we know that disasters amplify existing patterns of inequality. And so does the impacts of climate change and the disasters that they are fueling and, and amplifying, amplifying affect different populations differently and different populations and subpopulations have different capacities to be able to prepare for that and to be able to manage those risks. So we need to be understanding risk management with this equity lens, with this you know, lens of uh, understanding differential impacts. And then we need to start building our capacity for adaptation. So that means um, short term and very specific adaptation measures. It means longer term adaptation measures and moving those forward even as, as we've said a couple of times, we don't exactly know what the future is going to look like, but we need to be adapting with the future in mind. So that future thinking and being adaptive in our solutions themselves. So not imagining that, okay, I've done this, um, that's good, yes, it is, but then monitoring and evaluating and seeing how it works and where it's maladaptive or where it's really working well and how you can amplify that. So the course covers different kinds of adaptation and different kinds of risks, including those sort of immediate risks, but also risks and impacts that are secondary and that are tertiary and that are complex and intersect with each other. So this is a complex space, which is not said to be overwhelming, but I think we need to carry that understanding of complexity even as we try and break it down. And that's true of adaptation and mitigation. We need to be doing adaptation with mitigation in mind, understanding that all our ad adaptation measures will have consequences around uh, the release of, of uh, greenhouse gases and how to reduce that, and vice versa, that our mitigation measures also need to be do done in such a way that they are adaptive and supporting adaptation over time. And then we really talk about various key policies throughout the course. There is this emphasis on weaving in an understanding of Indigenous knowledges and perspectives. And that is in part an equity issue. So we say, you know, reconciliation is climate action, that understanding and working with our uh, with Indigenous populations and nations 
to address those issues that have arisen from colonization is really a part of climate action. And also understanding that there's great wisdom in those communities and that um, Indigenous communities have been adapting for eons, particularly adapting in the context of colonization, so that there's a lot of wisdom there. And there's a lot of real deep understanding and connection to the natural world, which in some cases we have lost. So that is also woven through the course. And, and the course finishes with some ideas and invitations for you to really think about what that can look like in your work uh, with the policies that you're creating, uh, understanding those large policies that we have in Canada, the adaptation strategy being one of them, but also looking at those smaller decisions and climate-informed decisions and climate-informed policies across all areas of the government and how you, we can contribute to that happening and adopting that climate lens in everything that we do. So that's really the course in a nutshell. Thanks very much, Robin. Uh, Sarah, I think you had maybe at one point you wanted to add about how the how the course is linked together. Yeah, yeah, just to sort of um, pull out a couple of themes that I heard there that I think are pretty pretty evident to any of you listening. That um, and and Robin made the point really really brilliantly that there's just so many ways that our ability to and um, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and mitigate climate change overlaps and intersects with our capacity to respond to the impacts of climate change to protect communities. And we have historically kept those very separate. Um, and we can't do that anymore. We have to move much more quickly towards thinking about those two simultaneously. For instance, wouldn't it be a shame, to put it mildly, um, if we rebuild after a flood or a fire homes that are deeply inefficient or reliant on on um, on fossil fuels for heat, that, that is an opportunity. All, all of our building back, all of our um, infrastructure investments present this remarkable opportunity to also advance progress on greenhouse gas reductions. And every time we don't do that, we're missing an opportunity. So Thinking about those two simultaneously are, is so important, and I think we all made efforts to do that through throughout our courses. Um, and I would also draw it back to a point I think James made earlier on in this um, in this session, which is that a, th a lot of things matter to us. You know, our physical health matters to us. Our the you know the vibrancy of nature, biodiversity matters to us. Um, good jobs and a prosperous economy matter to us, um, as well as um, uh, addressing climate change, whether through, you know, tackling the causes or the consequences of climate change, all of those things matter to us. So we have this opportunity to advance progress on all of those priorities simultaneously. If we succeed in collaborating really well and thinking across boundaries and being deeply strategic. So this is one of those, you know, kind of once in a lifetime, once in a generation opportunities to, um, to make meaningful progress on lots of things that matter to, to communities and learning this kind of stuff is just the first step, I think. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah. So I'm gonna, I have a couple questions and I'll maybe just, for each of them, I'll just kind of go around to each of you um, and, uh, and and just maybe look for some fairly quick responses to what may be hard questions, so I'll apologize in advance. But I wanna come back to uncertainty that's come up a little bit in our discussion today. And, and, and you know, James, for example, you said we kind of know where where we kind of need to go and what's there, but I, I am wondering, and I'll try not to be too much of a policy wonk here, but um, you know there are these big sort of how do, how do we think about? There's always going to be some uncertainty about timing when techno technologies become available. So, you know, when I was last here, it was a very much about moving from coal to natural gas and electricity, but of course that's still emitting, and we we know we now need to be um, thinking about uh, um, you know capture and storage and 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 small modular reactors and and you know we talk about hydrogen but there's issues about how you produce the hydrogen uh, in a, in in a non-emitting way or or all these kind of things on, on the mitigation side direct air capture like how do, how do we go how do we think about even if things are there we have to make choices and priorities and 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 maybe make some bets on what we think is most likely and so wondering what that looks like on a mitigation and on an adaptation side where we have a kind of a sense of and where where 
things are going, but we can't, you know, be completely sure about, you know, how do we prior prioritize uh, in the face of uncertainty in terms of something as massive as adjusting to adaptation? These are both societal projects, mitigation and adaptation. Simultaneously, they're both huge. How do we think about that kind of uncertainty and kind of, you know, pursuing both a mitigation and an adaptation agenda at the same time? And maybe I'll 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 I'll, st I'll start with you, James. You're muted again, James. Thanks for the easy question. Um, <laughs> I, um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll confine myself to the um, mitigation side. So um, Sarah made the, the point that many of the technologies, the first line of technologies that we need to deploy in order to dramatically reduce our emissions are already quite well known and, and quite well developed. There are other more exotic technologies that are still kind of in the R&D phase or the early demonstration phase that we're probably going to need after 2040 or something like that when we get there. But the big chunks of our emissions, um, some of them we know, and some of them the way to get them down is, is relatively straightforward. So about 12% um, of emissions of Canada come from light uh, light duty vehicles. So that's like cars and pickup trucks and, and things like that. We know that if you electrify those vehicles, uh, you can reduce all uh, carbon emissions at the point of combustion, um, uh, at the point of use, sorry, at the, at the end use phase. Uh, and we also know how to decarbonize the electricity system. Um, Many provinces, Canada, are already essentially net zero in their electricity systems, Quebec, BC, Manitoba, and others. There are a couple of provinces that have a problem because they have some coal still and maybe quite a bit of gas. So obviously, Alberta and Saskatchewan are the two biggest there. So they are going to have much more difficulty. But we know a whole raft of ways <laughs> to make net zero electricity, starting with wind and solar and hydro. And then there are other things like wave, <laughs> tidal, uh, deep geothermal, nuclear, fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage, and some uh, other offs offsets. So the core technologies to do that are there. Yes, small nuclear reactors may play, uh, small modular reactors may play an important role. They're not, you can't buy one off the shelf today, but there are lots of things you can buy off the shelf today. So let's start deploying them. Wind turbines you can buy off the thing, grid scale and ro home roof scale solar you can buy practically at Home Depot, but certainly you can buy them uh, ready-made. Electric vehicles production is ramping up all around the world as new battery plants go in and things like that. So I agree there is uncertainty about some of the midterm technologies, but we can start by really focusing on mass rollout of the ones that we do know, and that gives us some time to get more experience with the other technologies and drive their costs down so that when we do deploy them at scale, it won't be prohibitively expensive. Thanks, James. Sarah? Yeah, I mean it's it's a it's a really important question. What 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 are we uncertain about, and what are we um, what do we know for sure? And I, I guess you know I, I mentioned it earlier, but in the fundamentals course, we establish very clearly that concentrations of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere are very clearly going up. We've known this for a long time, and we know the connection <clears throat> between the concentrations, the amount of that um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and and warming at a global scale. Um, we also know that we, we have ruled out other um, natural explanations for that, uh, for the warming that we are seeing and experiencing, it's very clearly uh, due to human human activities. Um, so, so we have a foundation from which to launch to the next set of questions, which, you know, James is starting to take us to with, um, with the technologies that we need to make the first chunk of progress. And I would also just sort of, I guess, implore us to, 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 to move as quickly as humanly possible on those, especially also the ones like nature-based solutions and, and such that, that d deliver multiple priorities, deliver on multiple priorities simultaneously, um, rather than 
holding off on accelerating our uptake of those solutions in favor of technologies that, as James said, are not there yet. They're not um, widely available. The costs are prohibitive, et cetera. And, and I understand the desirability of, of you know some of those solutions like direct air capture and carbon capture and storage. Um, but we have but the solutions that we do have at our fingertips can also deliver so much more for us, right? We have improved air quality. We can have improved biodiversity. There's lots of things that come along with weaning ourselves off of fossil fuels in the very short term that, that are that are uh, very desirable. So we don't want the perfect to be the enemy of the good. We want to, you know, to move, um, or the enemy of the done <laughs> in this case, um, we want to move as quickly as we can with what we know so far, which is a lot. Thanks very much, uh, Sarah. Robin. Yeah, thanks. I think um, the first thing I would say is that, yes, there is uncertainty, but there has always been uncertainty. We as humans live with uncertainty and sort of pretend that there is certainty. Um, you know, the phrase, uh, the only thing certain is death and taxes. But it's true that, you know, we are constantly adapting to changes in our lives, unexpected losses, uh, unexpected opportunities, micro and macro changes. So we are adaptive creatures. And that comes back to some of the competencies, the creativity and innovation and being able to critically analyze what's going on. I think the other thing that I would say about uncertainty, particularly on the adaptation front, is that we actually know a lot of what we need to do. As I mentioned earlier, I, I come from a disaster management background, and there was a question in the chat earlier about building back better, which is a, a phrase that is being used a lot these days. We know a lot of what we need to do is uh, Yes, we need the technology on the mitigation side, and we need some technology on the adaptation side, but a lot of what we need are the social economic changes that support healthy communities, that support health equity, that support equity across um, the, the economic equi inequities. So I think, you know, in, in many ways, we have some certainty, some really foundational knowledge about what we need to do. And so it comes back in part to having the courage to do it, do, making informed choices, taking informed risks. It's not about just trying things haphazardly, but in some way, it is about gathering as much information as possible, recognizing there's never going to be all the information you need, all the partners at the table that you wanted, all the, all the resources that you hope for, and still taking action in that context. And I think, you know, in our, in the Resilience by Design Lab, we use design thinking a lot. And part of that is that, that um, ethos of being able to gather information from multiple perspectives and multiple sources, talk about it, be, be work together in a, in a deep meaning, uh, you know, way, not just sort of superficially gathering together, but really working together across differences, across uh, disciplinary and sector silos and boundaries, and then coming up with an evidence-informed choice and enacting it. And the other, so the other component of working with uncertainty is robust monitoring and evaluation of the choices that we make so that we can see how they're working and we can adapt and adjust as needed as things unfold. So I think really working with uncertainty is about having courage, um, working with the evidence, working with the information we have, collectively taking action based on that courage and being able to adjust course as we move forward with any adaptive measure that we that we take. And that is always going to be true, regardless of how well an adaptation measure is is and how well it does, it will need to be adapted as circumstances, as society changes, as impacts changes, as the climate changes. Thank you very much. Um, so listen, I, I feel like we've only scratched the surface uh, in the discussion today, which is which is in a way a good thing because it means that we leave people in their appetite and get them ready to go and, and, and look at these courses. So um, I, I really want to thank uh, you, Sarah and, and Robin and, 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 and James uh, for, for, for being with us today and sharing, you know, messages about both climate literacy and, 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 and 
ways to think about the issues and 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 to sort of sensitize public servants to the importance of these issues. Um, I want to also uh, nous remercions également nos participants virtuels d'avoir pris le temps de participer à cet événement et nous espérons que vous l'avez apprécié et que vous appris quelque chose de nouveau. Again, I really encourage everyone to register for the, these three courses, and I think our, our excellent panelists today uh, are the best uh, advertisements one can imagine for, for doing so. Please uh, uh, share your thoughts uh, on today's session by completing the electronic evaluation. And um, you know, now I'll, I'll just uh, in the way of, uh, of coming attractions, I'll note that there's always some excellent further things coming from the school and uh, looking at its looking at its catalog for future things. I will note that on, on November the 8th, the, the, there will be a virtual cafe uh, event on leadership reflections with Jocelyn Bourgon, um, who was, in, in fact, uh, 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 the, the clerk of the Privy Council when I joined the public service and, and is a really remarkable person. And, and she'll guide participants on how to cultivate and enhance talent and leadership within the public service. On the 23rd and 24th, there'll be a Policy Community 2023 conference on transforming the policy landscape, the rise of adaptive policy making. Um, L'école a d'autres événements à vous proposer et je vous encourage à visiter son site web pour vous tenir au courant et vous inscrire à toutes les, les, les futures opportunités d'apprentissage. Again, thank you to our participants, our panel members today, to all of you joined virtually. I think this was a really rewarding session. Thank you to the school. Thank you to uh, the folks here at Environment and Climate Change and other departments who were also very helpful in getting these courses in place. And uh, and, and I look forward to hearing about how, how everybody does going through these courses, which will be a huge value. Thank you all and have a great afternoon. Merci.